Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. So in the first session, there was a lot of talk about human, the mind, culture, and so on. But you think about the society, there is another important element, which is material. We need to have material prosperity to feel good, right? So uh, today, I'd like to talk about a branch of science which made a huge change in this material side, namely nanotechnology. So I entered the field in around 2000 as a graduate student. And at that time, the word nano became the buzzword that everybody wanted to use. When a, any kind of researcher would just put, try to put the word nano in the system they were working on. For example, we would say nano lasers, nano medicine, nano forest, as you can see here, or even nano star, whatever. Really, we try to put nano on everything to get research money. <laughs> extended beyond the scientific community and permeated even popular culture, such as the very iconic Terminator or Iron Man series, right? And of course, government need to pay attention. And in the United States, uh, there was this National Nanotechnology Initiative, which is continued even after 20 years from the beginning of nanotechnology. So nowadays, frankly, we don't really use the word nano as much. There's newer buzzwords such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, and so on. So we don't say nano, but this doesn't mean that the field is in decline. Rather, it means that nanotechnology has been so deeply integrated in our society that even mentioning it has become redundant. But we say nano, nano, but what is nanotechnology? In a very simple way to put it, nanotechnology just is about anything that has a size of around one to 100 nanometer, as is shown in this blue area in this scale. So to give you some perspective, a single strand of hair it's around 80 micrometer. So if you cut it down 1,000 times, then you're in the nanometer scale. You can also think it from a single atom. A single gold atom is around one-third of nanometer in diameter. So if you put three gold atoms together, you already reached one nanometer. So that is the scale that we're talking about. Some of the representative nanomaterials that you may have heard of is the buckyball, carbon-60, which has a similar shape as a soccer ball, and also DNA, and some other particles, and so on. But these kind of tiny particles can be found in even very ancient artifacts. For example, here is the Lycurgus cup from the fourth century. And this shows very interesting optical properties depending on the lighting condition. Under normal circumstances, this cup has this opaque green color. But if you put light inside, then it turns into this translucent red color. This is due to a small amount of gold and silver nanoparticle that is mixed into the glass. Another example is the Damascus sword from the eighth century. So legend says that these swords are so strong that the blade maintains its sharpness even after slicing through metal, stone, or other swords. And recently, researchers have found that there are a small amount of carbon nanomaterials and some other nanostructures mixed inside the blade which likely is the reason for the blades to have such strong mechanical strength. So you can already see from these examples that nanomaterial or nanotechnology can provide very useful and unique properties to material. But 
at this time, at these old times, there was really no way to really study this or to manipulate these particles. So how did the modern nanotechnology emerge? A very important milestone is these electron microscopes which was developed in the 1930s. So if you think about microscope, you typically use light, and the light would interact with the material, and then we would see the small particles. But in these microscope, instead of using light, you would use electron beams. And these beams would give a much higher resolution compared to the traditional optical microscopes, allowing us to see these small particles, and these are like different shaped gold nanoparticles that I studied as a student. Then, in 1959, there was this very renowned lecturer from uh, Richard Feynman named There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And in this lecture, Feynman asked Christian whether it would be possible for us to manipulate individual atoms or molecules to build up small devices. He also asked other thought-provoking questions such as whether it would be possible to inscribe the whole Encyclopedia Britannica on a single head of a pen. So this kind of question was later realized with the development of the scanning tunneling microscope in 1981. And this sort of uses something called a tunneling effect. But simply put, an electron, a single electron can jump from a sharp tip to the surface and go back. And during this process, it provides information of the surface in an atomic resolution as can be seen from that top image. And this also allowed us to grab a single atom and move it at a position that we want. And this here is xenon atoms. We grab it and then we align it so that it forms the word IBM. So if you think about this, nanotechnology allows us to look at and manipulate very small things. But that's really a very, very small part of nanotechnology. The essence of nanotech is to understand the unique chemical and physical properties that arises in this size scale. Um, so I'd like to sort of first say that when we think of a material, the atoms that is exposed on the surface and the atoms inside a material is very, very different because on the outside part, the atoms would interact with, of course, the outside environment. So it's chemical bonding, it's property, everything is different. And they're generally more reactive because they have bonds that are dangling outside. So let's say you have this kind of a bulk material and you start cutting it down into smaller pieces. Then naturally, you would have more and more atoms exposed to the surface. So this is, and that leads to very unique new properties. For example, let's say you have a gold of this size. Well, that would be very nice, right? <laughs> I'd want to have a gold of this size. But gold in this bulk state doesn't really react very much. It's, it's very, very stable. So it's called the noble metal because it doesn't change. But if you cut it down into nanometer scale, then it gets start to get involved in various reactions. For example, you go to the bathroom and then you have this nasty smell. And much of that comes from amine, a gas called amine. But gold nanoparticles can break down those amines into gases which doesn't smell anymore. So that kind of phenomena was actually applied to toilets to improve the air quality of bathrooms. These kind of properties also is very sensitive to the size and shape of the particle. For example, shown here is the so-called quantum dots. And these quantum dots can show varying colors from purple to red. 
just with a very small amount of uh, change in diameter in the range of 5 to 10 nanometer. So if you increase the size by 1 nanometer, 2 nanometer, even that change really brings a very different color. So what this means is that now we have the ability to manipulate the property of a material in a very precise manner. And that's the reason why I mentioned nanotechnology as a shift in paradigm on understanding material. So with the development of new types of material and our understanding of this interesting phenomena, nanotechnology has been applied to a wide range of sectors in the human society, spanning health, environment, electronics, and so on. So on my side, uh, my main focus is more on the application of nanotechnology for energy storage. So I'll use that as an example on how nanotechnology has improved our world. So one of the very serious concern in our society is the rising global temperature due to the accumulation of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane, right? You probably know of this scenario where if everything stays as is, then by 2050, a vast air urban area such as Shanghai will go underwater due to the rising sea level from the melting ice from Antarctica, right? So we need to do something. And nations worldwide is putting strong efforts into achieving the so-called carbon neutrality, where we're trying to balance the amount of greenhouse gas we emit and the amount that we can remove, okay? For example, in China, they announced the 3060 plan, which aims to achieve carbon peak, so the max emission by 2030, and then carbon neutrality by 2060, okay? And one of the important way to achieve this is to establish the so-called all electricity society which is characterized by electrifying the different sectors of our society using renewable energy, such as solar or wind power. And a key component to achieve this is the development of large capacity energy storage devices, which is represented by lithium ion batteries. So lithium ion batteries, I mean, now it's taken for granted, but if you look at the history, it's only about 20 years. The first lithium ion battery, commercial one by Sony was, came out in 1991, but it still took off only after it went, came into the 2000s. But once it start to be applied to electric cars and so on, you can see very rapidly this exponential growth of production of lithium ion batteries. And this has been enabled by technological advancements which brought into the drop in the battery cost and also to improved performance. Okay, so how did nanotechnology contribute to this? So many of you probably are using cell phone daily, but may not really understand how battery works inside. So I'll give you a, a quick um, explanation. So this is a schematic of a battery, and you have the cathode, which is composed of material like lithium cobalt oxide, and this serves as the source of lithium ions. And then you have the anode, which is typically composed of graphite. When you charge your battery, the lithium ion from the cathode moves to the anode and gets stored on its surface. And then when you connect it with another circuit, then the lithium ion goes back to the cathode and generates 
electric current along the way. So this is how we charge and discharge our battery. So in order to achieve strong performance from our battery, then we need to have a large surface area where lithium ion can be stored. And the ions should also be able to move back and forth very fast, right? We connect it and then charge, boom, and then go back, right? So what we have done is to develop new materials, such as shown here is um, a single atomic layer of graphite, which is also referred to as graphene. Uh, this is a material that got the Nobel Prize in 2005. And we are putting a lot of efforts into putting this into the anode material to improve the storage capacity. Also, in the cathode side, we try to design these kind of nanostructures inside, which will allow faster extraction and diffusion of the lithium ions and so on. So I'm not going to go into scientific details, I mean, but uh, throughout these efforts, now it has become possible to significantly improve the performance of battery, and it's still continuing with other new types of batteries, such as all solid state batteries, sodium ion batteries, and so on. And with this, developments uh, will really help the establishment of the all electric society that I just discussed, and eventually contribute to the climate changes as well. So looking ahead, nanotechnology has changed the society a lot during the past 20 plus years. Okay. So we consider the start of the nanotechnology around 2000 or the late 1990s. So it has been around 20, 25 years. If you think about battery, there's already a huge amount of change. And there's also nanotechnology impacted other sectors as well. For example, if you think about health, gold nanoparticles have been often used as a treatment for cancer cells, okay? We also use it as a probe to detect diseases and to tailor treatment for individual pat uh, patients. And later on, if we combine nanotechnology with AI, then we really may be able to develop smart material and devices which can maybe self-assemble, self-repair, or reproduce as seen, depicted in movies, right? So there's boundless possibilities that nanotechnology will be able to provide for, um, uh, in the future. But we do have to be a little bit careful because there's still not much that understood and what kind of negative impact that it may have to us. For example, because these particles are so small, we may be taking it into our body unknowingly, but once it comes in, it will stay in the body and lead to some damages and some diseases as shown here. Also, assessing the impact of nanomaterials to environment is almost non-existent. It's so complicated and it still needs to be done, but there's not much that we fully understand up to this point. So in conclusion, I think nanotechnology has really contributed to our society on the material side of view, and it will continue to do so. But, and we should embrace those kind of benefits, but at the same time, we should always be aware of what kind of hazard that it could bring to us and try to address these issues as soon as possible. Okay, thank you.